The peregrine falcon, the fastest animal in the world, with a top recorded speed of 242 miles per hour, renowned for strong hunting ability, athleticism and versatility, a courageous and formidable hunter able to catch much larger prey than itself. It's also the crest or cognizance of Shakespeare's coat of arms, answering the question, who is shaking the spear? Hello and welcome to the Speedy Dispatcher part two. My name is Glenn Alexander and thank you very much for watching this video. This is the second part in this four part series. If you've not seen part one, please do so beforehand as this is a continuation and cumulative. In part one, we began looking at this excellent book on falconry, specifically focusing on the first part of the book and better acquainting ourselves with two particular birds of prey, the peregrine and falcon gentle. Now, the first thing we're going to do in this video is stitch together a web, as it tells us to do. Take a slender long needle, afterwards thread it with untwisted thread and draw it through both ends of the bruised places, then draw it back by the threads until it may draw that one part to the other so as the web may be close joined together. So if you see this sign, that means we're trying to closely join this web together. We're going to start with this book that started my interest in armoury, i.e. coats of arms, and led to my interest in the falcon uh, on top of Shakespeare's coat of arms. So we're going to start here too. Now you'll notice beneath the shield we have this uh, quote which is from Ovid's Metamorphoses. We know that because it's in the back. It tells us it's from Ovid's Metamorphoses. Widely regarded as one of the most influential works for Shakespeare. Now I'm going to suggest this book is also by the same author as the book of Falconry. And it's one of the books that's at the centre of this web, a nexus and node of meaning, which will direct us from here to other significant connections and books. It kind of does actually tell you this here. There are whole books, as I'm very credibly informed, of the ensigns, symbols or arms of this once noble people. Therefore, I will here now only give you the arms of Mexico. Now, within the elements of armories, there aren't any direct references to falcons, but there are indirect references, as here. Um, this is actually from the Codex Tober 1587, although you'll notice that the, um, the trees are quite more um, pointy and sharp, almost like a spear. Uh, here we have an eagle, a bird of prey, which is referenced in many times in the Book of Falconry, holding in one foot a bird. This was the sign which the oracle, capital O, or in heraldry in coats of arms is gold, gave them. Um, and if we have a look at the tricking, that's using one or two letters to represent the colours in a coat of arms, You'll notice A for Argent, which is silver, PR for proper, the natural colour of the thing. Well, it just so happens in Shakespeare's coat of arms, the draft grant issuing such, the colours that they reference are proper and Argent too. On page 40, a very significant page, which we will return to some of these bits in a later episode, uh, a lewd Turkish ensign stands, which one day yet, oh God, you'll notice on the O you have a diacritic pointing upwards. Thou wilt raise by the martial arms of some zealous prince who shall bear it in the canton of his royal coat armour for perpetual memory of the conquest. All other our like endeavours, as unto their vertical point, aspire, there being no felicity but as we may to seek the glory of God. And you'll notice with our uh, falcon, he is holding that spear, or she is holding that spear um, vertically, pointing upwards. Scepters or rods on top, 
uh, whereof some symbolical images of others as of a bird, a fish, etc. A, the terrible dove, era Columbi, the terrible dove. Well, it's not a falcon, but it does have some similarity. You could poetically call a, a falcon a terrible dove. This is what I like to call... Um, poetic aberration aberration in optics is when the light is spread out in space so it doesn't converge on a focal point and here we're not focusing on the thing itself but on like things that share some of the characteristics as here it were pleasing but not much pertinent here out of one authentic author to declare the assyrians bear a dragon out of another, the uh, Cyrus, the Persian monarch, bear a golden eagle, and the like innumerable. Now, in chapter 16, we have a reference here to geometry. And this is leading us to this book here, The Elements of Geometry. I know this because there are multiple references to the elements of geometry by Euclid, the geometrical elements. Um, Euclid... Euclid's elements, Euclid's geometrical elements, it really is directing you to this book. And if we have a look at the frontispiece of this book and look in this corner here, well, you'll find something really quite remarkable. If you have a look at what people are either pointing to or looking at, well, we have a king, another king, the, a, a cherub there, a a uh, the king of the animal kingdom an old man scratching his head is looking at this and uh, a winged man with a sickle looking at this as well so we have six people all looking at what is a bird in the clouds now how do we know what this bird is well let's ask the person who has wings and you'll find in the book of falconry um, when he discusses etymology, he's actually he, he gives you the definition of falcon. Uh, Festus, in his opinion, that the falcon is so named because of her pounces and crooked talons, which do bend like unto a sith or sickle, which in Latin is called falx. So the falcon is named after the sickle, and one of the people front and centre on the frontispiece is holding a sickle and looking at this bird. So we can be pretty sure that bird is indeed a falcon. The Elements of Armouries also references this author multiple times, Gerard Lee. Now this leads us to this book here, The Ascendance of Armoury, a book on how to blaze, which is describe a coat of arms correctly and lawfully. Um, the two characters here are Gerard a uh, Herhort or Herald and Lee, a knight who have a dialogue all the way through this book whilst teaching about Blazon, how to describe a coat of arms. If we have a look uh, in again, we we have some falcon references. So a Blazon by the days in the week. I like week um, because it's we and eek. Eek means use sparingly to last longer. Devised by Falcon, Principal Herhort, Principal Herald in England, in the time of the famous King Edward III. Well, Falcon is an archaic spelling of Falcon. And if we have a look at Edward III's coat of arms, you'll notice that there is a falcon supporting it. So we very much do have a reference to a falcon there. Uh, on page 113... Badge of the Ox starts in, in his pastime of hawking, for princes may take unto themselves what device they will. Poets compare one of the nine muses with their appropriate people as Calope dwells in the highest and swiftest spear. Hold on, that says spear. Yes, it does say spear. Uh, this author does know how to, how to spell spear correctly, because if you look back three lines, you'll see that we have sphere versus spear. So this author is being awfully cunning here and swiftest. Remember the peregrine falcon is the swiftest animal in the world. 
princes may take unto themselves what devices they will, so it be born of no man before that time. Uh, this is very clever because there isn't for a badge uh, the falcon born of any man before, but there is of a woman. And that woman happens to be the arms of Anne Boleyn, where you'll find a falcon atop. Uh, Anne Boleyn, of course, the mother of Elizabeth I. Here we're again talking about our badges, um, and he tells a lovely story uh, here about the tailor and the shoemaker, uh, but will be as gentleman-like as the gentleman himself. I read a pretty story, which he tells you, I've encouraged you to read it, because it's great. It's about a shoemaker uh, who wants to be dressed like a knight and gets his just desserts. Uh, the which, for that I do wish each man to be known as he is. I will declare his doing in that point to you as a pattern for gentlemen to reprove such as like apes counterfeit that as appertaineth not to them. And in the, uh, the story he tells, he refers to cloth as should make himself a gown. He uses the word garments in that story, much like coats. Every man weareth at his day as he liketh. You'll notice in the, uh, the side there we have some additional notes with that uh, bizarre looking uh, manicure. I'm not sure whether that's a hand or something with feathers. Uh, this, I believe, no uh, shows understanding of crests borne by themselves, for I have sundry ancient seals of my ancestors in Edward III's time, who we've just met, and Richard II, uh, where this coat of arms and crests obey the same, and it's in brackets here, cognizance, cognize, um, is set upon the helmet both with wreath and mantle. This word cognizance, cognize, that's an interesting word because with Shakespeare's draft grants issuing his coat of arms, we have a cognizance of a falcon, a cognizance, a falcon, and a cognizance, a falcon. We also have another book referred to, uh, Minerva's, Minerva's Shield. Well, this is referring to this book here, Minerva Britanna. Uh, it, you'll notice it in block capitals, it was also Roman, as is Minerva. Uh, the Romans did name Britannia Britain. Um, it also says a coat of arms. And on the front of this book, on the frontispiece, we have a coat of arms. It says a shield for censors. And on the first page, it does tell you it is a secret arm. So we have a secret arm on the front of this book. The most important point is it's printed in shoe lane at the sign of the falcon. We also have some other Minerva references and Roman again so we can be pretty sure that it is referring to Minerva Britanna uh, but even more so because the images of ancestors very pretty was that conceit uh, which my friend Master Seagar Garter, Principal King of Arms, which just so happens in the front of the book we have a dedicated poem by William Sagar, Principal King of Arms, and in the Elements of Armories, we have our first dedicated letter, also by William Sagar, Garter King of Arms. So we can be pretty sure that these books are very much connected. Um, within this letter, I would like you to pay attention to this, because you'll meet this in a later episode, the Finis Coronat Opus, uh, the end that crowns the work, or perhaps the crown that ends the work, so we also have this for Quicksilver and the ghost does say in Hamlet that swift as Quicksilver it courses through. Um, we are discussing speed here. Why am I looking in Hamlet? Well you remember from episode one uh, the glowworms from uh, the ghost speech and we have glowworms in Hamlet. So you can see there's an overlap of some of the expressions we're using. That was actually the first um, time that I, I thought I'll check Hamlet because glowworms is a particularly unusual uh, word. So that was the beginning of the book printed at the sign of the falcon. This is the middle of the book. We have well a picture of a falcon, servere uh, nescit, uh, eager to serve. The princely falcon 
hath long been manned and taught to stoop unto the tossed law, is now escaped from his master's hand and will no more such servitude endure, but better likes the field. Which is so happens Shakespeare's first ever work was printed by Richard Field. And and Forrest Spray, and for himself in elder age to pray, well, it just so happens that the Elements of Armouries is printed by George Eld. The virtuous mind and truly noble sprite can seldom brook. Well, it just so happens there was a herald in 1602 called Ralph Brooke who submitted a list of unworthy or base people who he believed had incorrectly been issued arms to the Queen, and number four on the list was Shakespeare, in bondage base to serve, but most doth in his liberty delight, still rather choosing by himself to stirve, than eat some caterpillar's envied bread, ed, or at another's courtesy be fed, ed. Uh, and you'll remember from um, the Book of Falconry, when we categorised our falcons, and the falcon was number four also. At the end of this book, with the author's conclusion, it starts, As then the sky was calm and fair, the winds did cease and clouds were fled, Aurora scattered Phoebus's hair, new risen from her rosy bed. That will make more sense in an episode or two. Uh, we have our first falcon references. Uh, with Falcon for the King's Delight, and Crownets for her Petty Kings. York's Lock that did the Falcon Shroud, that's our second Falcon reference, and Brave Falcon Bridge. And two lines before that, the Loyal Veer. Why am I telling you that? Because the last two lines of this poem, of those brave worthies, Brave Falcon Bridge, faithfully, a synonym of faithful, is loyal. The Loyal Veer, Brave Falcon Bridge, The Loyal Veer, shall in another book be told. So we have Falcon three times there. Um, there's also this uh, wonderful impress, impress uh, Tandem Divulganda, finally published. You remember York's Lock that did the Falcon Shroud from the conclusion. And here we have a key with wings. And the last two lines here. And greatest secrets, though they hidden lie, abroad at last, with swiftest wings they fly. Uh, you'll meet this again. We have these two. And in the footnotes, we have someone being referenced here. Ripper, Caesar Ripper, Caesar Ripper Iconologia. It was repeated in the references, so I thought I'd better check this book, and I'm glad I did. This is the Iconologia by Caesar Ripper, and within this book, which is a magnificent book, I, I really love this book, um, you have this um, impress here, which is verity and modest bashfulness. And you'll notice with modest bashfulness, she's holding a falcon in her right hand. What is the falcon looking at? But verity, and verity is looking at the sun, so we seem to be looking at the sun there. Um, so Verity, I'm just going to pop that name that we uh, we just looked at associated with Brave Falcon Bridge there, uh, the Loyal Veer. So this is uh, Verita, Verity. This naked beauty holds a sun in her right hand, in her left a book open with a palm under one foot the globe of the world, naked because downright simplicity is natural to her. The sun shows her great delight in clearness. The book that the truth of all things, that's what uh, verity means, truth, uh, may be found in good authors. The palm her rising the more she is depressed. The globe, that being immortal, she is the strongest of all things in the world and therefore tramples upon it. And just going to put uh, this picture of the Shakespeare bust from the funerary monument um, as I read through it. Vergona Honesta, modest bashfulness, a modest, sweet looking girl casting down her eyes, clad in red, cherry cheeks. There does seem to be some blushing on Mr. Shakespeare's face. An elephant's head. Uh, elephants do tend to be bold. Uh, for her headdress, a falcon in her right hand. Well, it's, it's not a falcon, but there is a feather for a quill in Mr Shakespeare's, and a scroll in the left, there is a page there, inscribed Dysopia Procul 
deceptive uh, vision from far away. The cheeks and gown denote blushing, the elephant bashfulness, seeking privacy in the venerable act, the falcon modesty, for if it fail to catch its prey, it is so ashamed that it can scarce be reclaimed to the fist. Within the elements, we also have our third dedicated letter from Mr Thomas Beddingfield. I return them in haste, fearing to foul, remember foul is a bird, the paper or injure the ink. And it's by uh, Thomas Beddingfield. Now Thomas Beddingfield um, translated a work by Cardinal's Comfort, the Italian uh, polymath uh, Geronimo Cardinus, uh, which is dedicated and published by the commandment of the Right Honourable Earl of Oxford. That's the Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. You'll notice on the front we have a coat of arms with a bird, well, two birds on there, a bird with a halo and a bird um, across the chevron. And in the front of the book we have a letter to the Earl of Oxford, and a letter from the Earl of Oxford, but th this letter I quite like because it nicely says, arms being your Lord's chief profession and mine also. So apparently uh, armoury coats of arms are Edward de Vere's chief profession, apparently, according to Mr Beddingfield. Although there is, if you notice Mr Beddingfield there, there isn't an eye in field anymore. Uh, there's also a poem by the Earl of Oxford to the reader. Here's it a little bit more clearly, which is very telling. And hopefully by the end of these videos will make a lot of sense. Um, the labouring man that tills the fertile soil and reaps the harvest fruit hath not indeed the gain but pain. If for all his toil he gets the straw, the Lord will have the seed. The swiftest hare unto the mastiff slow, oft times doth fall to him as for a prey. The greyhounds thereby doth miss his game, we know, for which he made such speedy haste away. So he that takes the pain to pen the book reaps not the gifts of goodly golden muse, but those gain that who on the work shall look, and from the sour the sweet by skill doth choose. For he that beats the bush the bird not gets, but who sits still and holdeth fast the nets? Well, it just so happens in our book of falconry, we uh, we have um, something described for us. Uh, these kind of hawks are used of such as to go with nets and spaniels, the order of which game is this. Uh, this is a sport called daring. The dogs, they range the field to spring the fowl, which means get the fowl in the air. And the hobbies, they accustom to flee aloft over them, soaring in the air, whom they, the silly birds, espying at their advantage, fearing this conspiracy, as it were, betwixt the dogs and the hawks, for their undoing and confusion, dare in no wise commit themselves to their wings, but do lie as close and flat on the ground as they possibly may do, and so are taken in the nets, which with us in England is called daring, a sport of all other most proper to the hobby. Um, I'm also just going to alert you to this. This is put in brackets. There was the edition. But you'll notice the E in, in this uh, copy of the book seems to be uh, floating there, which gives me an ideal opportunity um, to remind you uh, about the figure of addition. This is the first figure of rhetoric taught in book three, uh, all of ornaments, all about ornaments in the art of English poesy. The figure of addition is adding one letter to um, change or add to the meaning of a word, uh, which is the first thing he teaches in book three. You'll notice book has an E on the end, so there's perhaps more meaning to this book by adding a single letter. This also happens to be what this uh, gentleman who you'll meet in a second is pointing to. He is pointing to this E and temples also means in uh, Sumerian E. So he's pointing to an E. Now we're about to go daring and may even catch someone with a spear 
in our nets, as alluded to in the Minerva Britanna. Now, this is actually uh, Pale Athena or Minerva, the patron goddess of playwriting. But before we do that, we need to learn a little bit about spaniels, how necessary a thing a spaniel is to falconry. And for those that use that pastime, keeping hawks for their pleasure and recreation, I deem no man doubteth as well to spring and retrieve a fowl being flown to the mark. The dogs, they range the field to spring the fowl. Remember, that means to get the fowl in the air so the hawk can seize it. A good spaniel maketh a good hawk, and the best spaniel for the job, according to our author, is the greyhound, and well made for the purpose, and a greyhound will be most readily made. This is the Shakespeare monument in Westminster Abbey. He is the person who is pointing to the E in temples, and directly opposite this monument we have this one. If we have a closer look at it, you'll notice on the front we have Edward and Robert in capital letters. And at the top of it, we have these greyhounds. Our greyhounds will be most readily made. And in the commendation of hawking in the front of our book on falconry, of spaniels first I mean to speak, for they begin the glee, who being once uncoupled, when they feel their collars free, in roisting wise about they range, with cheerful chaps to ground, to see wherein the champion may some lurking fowl be found. A sport to view them stir their sterns in hunting to and fro, and to behold how nature doth her power in spaniels show. Uh, you also notice on the scroll there, Wink it cum legibus armour, he wins with the law of arms. Now, that monument we just looked at is there opposite the Shakespeare monument in Poets' Corner of Westminster Abbey. Now, at the ends of Poets' Corner, we have these two monuments, which are also quite significant. The first one, which is along the same wall as our monument with greyhounds, is this one. This is the monument to William Camden. And in the front of the Elements of Armouries, we have our second dedicated letter by none other than William Camden, the Clarence King of Arms, the second highest ranking herald in the country, who also issued Shakespeare his coat of arms in draft grant number three. Now, there's lots going on in this monument, including a few errors. Uh, but the only thing I need you to remember is what is on the front of this book. There is a lozenge shape on the front of this book. That's all I need you to remember. So if we have a look at the other monument, this is a monument by the Earl of Oxford to O'Rare Ben Johnson, a dedicated monument. And above these masks is O'Rare Ben Johnson. And if we notice, there are two dots there. There's a colon um, in between uh, the name, uh, which you also have with Edmund Bolton in his Elements of Armouries. You may also notice the H in Johnson, which is not normally there. Just ignore that for the minute. And there's also a golden lamp on the top of this monument. So if we put our learning together, we have O-Rare Ben Johnson plus our lozenge shape. If you put them together, what do you get? We get this O-Rare Ben Johnson, which you will find in the Northern Isle of Westminster Abbey in the Isle of the Scientists. Now, funnily enough, Ben Johnson is the only person buried in an upright position in Westminster Abbey. The only person buried standing on his feet. And you remember, may remember from our elements of armories, all other are like endeavours, as unto their vertical point aspire, there being no felicity, but as we may, to seek the glory of God. Our falcon is holding our spear upright. And the last thing in the main book of the Elements of Armouries that's written, thus much for position 
the last element of the four, and here, by your good favour, I, and it's italicised, will pitch up one of my columns. Dio Glatius, give thanks to God. And indeed he has pitched up one of his columns, uh, his most uh, natural and important column, his body. How do we start, Hamlet? Who's there? Nay, answer me, stand and unfold yourself, long live the king, he. As Hamlet says, but bear me stiffly up, remember thee? And later on, one of the last things he says in Hamlet, things standing thus unknown shall live behind me. Now, amazingly, above this lozenge of our rare Ben Johnson, you have a falcon. This beautiful falcon, which seems to be pointing down at the grave of Ben Johnson, also holding a scepter upright. Now, Ben Johnson is very relevant because he starts the first folio with his dedicated poem to the reader. And this is directly opposite the frontispiece of the first folio. This figure that thou seest put, it was for gentle Shakespeare cut, wherein the graver had a strife with nature to outdo the life. Oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he hath hit his face, the print would then surpass all that was ever writ in brass. But since he cannot, reader, look not on his picture, but his book by Ben Jonson. You may notice the italicised E in reader of the title there and the E's on the end of book and look. Now, if we return to this uh, grave, this is going to make this dedicated poem make a lot more sense. Now, this is the grave of John Hunter, perfect grave to have a hunting bird on. Much more might be said on stripes and bruises of hawks, but I do leave you over to the learned physician and skilful surgeon, it says in our book of falconry. And John Hunter apparently was the founder of scientific surgery. Oh, there's our O. Could he have but drawn his wit as well in brass? Well, according to Westminster Abbey, this falcon is made of brass. This grave is made of brass. He hath hit his face. There's an IHS there, his IHS. Uh, the print would then surpass all that was ever writ in brass. It was for gentle. Well, you've seen the Hamlet joke, but the falcon gentle taketh stand more willingly upon the ground. Shakespeare cut. We are dealing with a surgeon, wherein the graver had a strife well, this is a grave, with nature to outdo the life. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. Now, a few pages later, Ben Jonson also has this poem, to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr William Shakespeare, and what he has left us. Now, you remember the monument opposite Shakespeare also was to the memory, and Ben Jonson signs his name with that colon. Now, this is a wonderful poem, which we will explore. And we're going to start to explore it with Sweet Swan of Avon. What a sight it were to see thee in our waters yet appear and make these flights upon the banks of Thames that so did take Eliza and our James. And we also have some talking about flight, which since by flight from hence. Now, it just so happens that the 1575 publication of the Book of Falconry had this wonderful picture of Queen Elizabeth, um, what seems like by the banks of the Thames, out hawking with her falcon there. Well, it also just so happens that in the 1611 publication of this book, we have James out by the banks of the Thames also hawking, because Falconry was a was a, the sport of kings and queens. So, and make those flights upon the banks of the Thames. There's our Thames, there's our Eliza, there's our James. So why are we called the sweet swan of Avon? Well, feeding hawk, my turn for colon. 
Sweet Swan of Avon, although Ben Johnson did miss out Sweet and Tasty Swan of Avon. Sweet, well, as it tells us, sugar candy of each alike quantity and make thereof a powder. Sprinkle some of that powder on the part whereof you reward her and it shall make her love that kind of prey the better ever afterwards. Swan. The flesh of the swan and many other kinds of waterfowls, too long here to be rehearsed, are to be used according to the time and circumstance of occasion. And Avon, well, Avon, it's river fowl, sweet swan of Avon. And you'll meet that shield with a swan on in a minute. So there we go, Mr Shakespeare. Our sweet swan of Avon, very tasty with his bold fleshy head and a feather in his hand. And our falcon above. And as it says, to the end his hawk may continue the more boldly to flee great, which means chase, great flights. And here, but those, um, yet some there be, but those are very rare. And you remember he told us before that the peregrine or haggard falcon are more rare and passing in perfection, which fleeing all kinds of fowls, such as sweet swans, become still harder and harder and better and better. Understanding Shakespeare is our river fowl better helps us understand emblems like levitas, which means levity, a youth arrayed in sundry colours, light and painted plumes, i.e. feathers that overspread his crest. His right hand holds the bellows to his ears, his left the quick and speedy spur doth bear. Such is Caprico, which in Italian means a prank. And the last line, accept what Ripper dedicates to you. So again, referring us over to Caesar Ripper's Iconologia, where you'll find the pretty much the same emblem that you have here, apart from it's called here Humusums. Number 44, Caprico, humorsomeness. So our prank is our humorsomeness. A young spark in a garment of various colours with a little cap on his head like his clothes stuck with feathers of several colours. Bellows in one hand and a spur in the other. The capricious fellow would be singular. His youth shows his inconstancy, his habit, his fickleness. His cap shows that such variety of unaccountable actions are principally in the fancy. The spur and bellows his proponents to praise other men's virtue or to vent pricking scoffs against their vice. Here's some humorsomeness. Every man in his humour. A comedy by Ben Johnson first acted in the year 1598 with Shakespeare in the cast followed a year later by every man out of his humour with Shakespeare out of the cast. What is this humour? Well, let the characters tell you. Humour, Mac, I think it be so. Indeed, what is that humour? Some rare thing, I warrant. A warrant like a coat of arms, for instance, which was issued a year later in 1599, the third and final draft grant. Mary, Mary Arden, Shakespeare's mother. I'll tell thee, Cobb, it's a gentleman-like monster. Well, we've seen gentlemen like a few times already, including in the contents of the book of falconry, most excellent and gentleman like quality. Bred in the special, notice the double L there, I'll mention that shortly. Gallantry of our time by affectation and fed by folly. And from every man out of his humour, let the world be not without mustard. Your crest is very rare, sir, the not without mustard alluding to the amount of gold in Shakespeare's coat of arms, a very rare crest indeed. And if we have a look at page four, the act one, scene one of every man in his humour, uh, you have the character Edward Nowell. You actually have two Edward Nowells, senior and junior in this play, having a conversation um, I'm just going to put that name up there as well. Uh, Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. Call up your young master. Bid him rise, sir. Noel, but hear you, sirrah, if he be at his book, 
disturb him not. Myself was once a student, and indeed fed with the same humour, he is now dreaming on naught but idle poetry, that fruitless and unprofitable art, good unto none but least to the professors, which then I thought the mistress of all knowledge, but since time and the truth have waked my judgment, and reason taught me better to distinguish the vain from the useful learnings. Cousin Stephen. Stephen's an interesting name because it means wreath and crown. Uh, what news with you that you are here so early? Um, nothing but uh, in come to see how you do, uncle. That's kindly done. You are welcome, cuz. I, I know that, sir. I would not have come else. How do my cousin Edward, uncle? Oh, well, cuz, go in and see. I doubt he be scarce stirring yet. Uncle, afore I go in, can you tell me, uh, the, uh, have a, a book of the sciences of hawking and hunting? I would fain borrow it. Well, I wonder whether Edward Nowell has this book of falconry in his library. Why, I hope you will not a hawking now, will you? No, uh, but I'll practice against next year, uncle. I have brought me a hawk and a hood and bells and all. I lack nothing but a book to keep it by. Oh, most ridiculous. And the last line, nor stand so much on your gentility. So, Sonnet 91. Hopefully this makes a little bit more sense now in light of our previous discussions. Some glory in their birth, some in their skill, some in their wealth, some in their body's force, some in their garments, though new fangled ill, some in their hawks and hounds, some in their horse, and every humour hath his adjunct pleasure, wherein it finds a joy above the rest. But these particulars are not my measure, all principal comedians were Will Shakespeare. These I better in one general best. Thy love is bitter than high birth to me, richer than wealth, prouder than garments cost, of more delight than hawks or horses be, and having thee of all men's pride I boast, wretched in this alone, and that thou mayst take all Daring, a sport of all, this away, as it says in the Ascedents, away and every man weareth at this day, and me most wretched make. Remember, from our first episode, make means poetry. To be a poet is to make. From every man out of his humour, we can then understand where the O oh, rare Ben Johnson comes from. As it says here, O oh, admirable rare, he cannot choose but be a gentleman that has these excellent gifts. More, more, I beseech you. And also, O oh rare, good, 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 good. I thank my stars. I thank my stars for it. And actually, those stars will make sense a little bit uh, later. But notice there, see how the strumpet fortune tickles him. That's quite relevant, given Edward's. Uh, his name meaning comes from Old English, Eid, meaning wealth, prosperous or fortune, and weird, guardian or protector. As he says in the book of Falconry, I thank fortune to stand needful of the practice. And there's this lovely bit here as well. Low bird, low, that is a very low Bird, for in this manner she will learn to take the stand and feed her always on the ground. I also love this bit. Hey, low birds, hey, low. Well, if you have a look on the grave of John Hunter, you'll find the evangelists, the four evangelists, all with halos, telling you the good news. So here is the grave of O Rare Ben Johnson, or whoever is really buried underneath this stone in the Northern Isle of Westminster Abbey, the Isle of Scientists. It's an incredibly inconspicuous grave, very easily walked over without even knowing it's there, and a very humble grave.
The second part of the book of this collection of falconry, certain special points necessary for a falconer or ostriger collected out of the Italian authors, has this bit. First, it is a behooful for a falconer to be very diligent and inquisitive to learn and mark the quality and metal of his hawks and to know which hawk he shall fly with all rarely. Now, if we have a look at what the angels, those winged angels, above this grave are pointing to, you will notice the angel with the trumpet is pointing to the T of two. This is quite relevant as T comes from the Phoenician Tor, or Tav meaning mark. And as we saw before, to learn and mark the quality. And from our treatise on Spaniels, we retrieve a fowl being flown to the mark after it has been sprung by our Spaniels. So there we go. There is our fowl. We let slip the dogs of war who will spring this fowl, hopefully to the mark where we have our falcon. In England, this is called daring a sport of all other and as the Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere, tells us, For he that beats the bush, the bird not gets, but who sits still and holdeth fast the nets. And hopefully we will catch a playwright. Now, the falcon we have here is a little hawk, but we are told a little hawk and a large tersel is ever best, a large peregrine falcon is best. So in part three, we will reclaim a large falcon, meet a very eloquent muse, let the birds tell the matter and welcome home a prince. I'll see you then. Thank you very much.